Hi everyone, welcome to the Sacred Musings podcast with me, Phil Saker. It is the 23rd of June, 22. It's episode 40 of the podcast. Can't believe we got to 40 already. And today we are thinking about rebuilding government and whether we can move beyond the left and right. So welcome, folks. Um, You know, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at uh, building a Christian worldview. And today I wanted to start applying that to the government or or to continue applying that to the government. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were thinking about whether everything is capitalism's fault. And we said, no, it's not capitalism's fault. Actually, it's the fault of human nature. It's the fault of what in the Christian worldview we call sin. So what I wanted to do today is turn and think about how then can we start applying that to government the christian worldview which we were thinking about those four steps how can we apply that to government and can we perhaps move beyond the left and the right i think it's it's a big topic and obviously there's a lot more that could be said and that's something which uh, i will i'm sure we will come back to in due course um so it's just an introduction, really. Just my, just some of my thoughts. Um, I'm kind of thinking out loud as I'm doing this, but I hope it's helpful to you as well to hear that thinking. And I, I do encourage you to join in and you know, share your thoughts with me as that does help me too. And uh, do feel free, if you're on YouTube, to comment. If you're listening on the podcast, you can join in on Telegram. And, uh, or you can uh, just email me, sacredmusingspod at gmail.com. And the links will all be down in the description below if you'd like to get in touch. But before we get on to that, there's one reflection that I'd like to share. And it's this. It's not about lockdowns anymore. I know a lot of people came to this channel when I started talking about lockdowns. And that was how it all began a couple of years ago or so. When I started thinking about lockdowns and I started thinking about how wrong it all was. But it seems to me we have massively moved on from that. It's not about lockdowns anymore. It seems to me the question is much more, which world are we living in? Are we living in a fantasy reality world or are are we actually living in the kind of world where we are able to, to live by the truth? You know, it's not just about masks and about whether lockdowns work or all of those things, but That whole pattern of things was happening well before that. And it's something which I and many other people have only just really picked up on. That well before 2020, that we were being asked to believe things which were actually not true. And we were living, starting to live in this kind of fantasy world. I was reading a really good article um, the other day, uh, yesterday in fact, by Andrew Doyle published on Unheard, saying the experts are lying to you. The subtitle is, their laundering of the truth is deliberate and tactical. But what he said is that the experts are, they're not basing what they say on the truth anymore, but actually it's a claim of authority, you know, because I'm an expert, because I've got the qualifications, I can tell you what's true or not, rather than their claim to authority coming from their basis in the truth. And I think he's absolutely bang on the money. And I think this is where we we need the truth. You know, we it's not about lockdowns anymore. We need to base everything on the truth. We need to be living in the real world. We need to be living in the real world where truth has and untruth has consequences, where there are consequences of what we believe. So, for example, just the uh Again, um, looking at Steve Kirsch and what he's written on his blog on a couple of days ago, he just said young people dying in their sleep is now happening on a regular basis. And there was a, an X Factor star has um, his fiance died on the day of their wedding, aged 34. And it said the cause of death is not known. And he goes through and looks at how a lot of Uh, It seems to be happening more and more. For example, if you look at the number of Google searches for healthy young people dying or sudden adult death syndrome or died suddenly, there's a massive spike um, quite recently. And it just seems to be happening more and more that younger people are just dropping dead and there's no explanation given. The cause of death is unknown. Why is that happening? 
Now, well, perhaps it is related to a particular medical treatment which many young people have taken over the last couple of years, and that's there's a causal relationship there. There's a direct causal relationship. Um, surely we should be allowed to actually say that. Or it's not just that. It's about you know things like inflation, the cost of living crisis, the the migrant crisis, and you know, all of those things. Are we living in the real world? Are we actually able to say that you know maybe shutting down the economy for two years, and you know putting people on furlough has led to this inflation crisis, printing a ton of money. You know maybe that's led to the inflation crisis or been a big factor contributing to it. All of these kind of things. It's all very well to live in a fantasy world if it doesn't affect you, but it's starting to bite. And that's the problem. There are people dying. There are people who are struggling. There are people who are suffering. And we have to be allowed to, to get to the truth because you know, to alleviate people's suffering, the only way of doing that is actually by basing what we say on the truth rather than on the narrative. But it's not just on COVID. It's not just on lockdowns. It's about so many issues now. You know, we just need to get to the truth. We need to cut through the nonsense, the, the what we're told by the experts and actually look at the truth. And sometimes perhaps the experts might be telling us the truth. You know, I don't want to be suspicious of them just because they're experts. But the point is that we need to look at what the, the truth is, what the data actually is. And be prepared to have those com difficult conversations because that's the only way that we are going to make any progress is if we can live in the real world, we can deal with real problems, we can deal with real truth rather than basing everything in this kind of fantasy reality world. It's not about lockdowns anymore. It's about which world we're living in. And that's why I think this fight has to continue. No, it's no longer a fight about whether lockdowns were effective. You know, that was settled long ago. It's no longer even a fight about whether the vaccines are safe and effective. The fight is which world are we living in? You know, are we living in the kind of world where we can base these discussions on real hard evidence, data, facts, on reality, or whether we can only go with what the narrative actually says? That is the that's the big question that we need to settle. And that is why I think this fight has to be won, because otherwise this fantasy world is going to destroy itself and going to take us along with it. So I'm sorry, folks, if that turned out to be a little bit more of a rant than I was expecting. Um, but I think it has to be said. Um, anyway, with all of that said, let's move on now to thinking about the main section, thinking about the left and the right and thinking about rebuilding government. Let's look into that now. So in this episode of Sacred Musings, I want to look at uh, rebuilding government, whether it's possible to move beyond the left and the right. Now, one of the fascinating things which has happened over the past few months is I've noticed that left and right uh, politically are becoming more and more meaningless. And I think this was happening well before COVID, but it seems to be you know, more and more the case. So um, I've just put a few points down, which is that the Conservative government, the so-called Conservative government, over the last couple of years have not really enacted many Conservative policies. Um, for example, the massive government spending through the pandemic, uh, like on the furlough schemes. There's been virtually no difference between the political parties in the way that they would have handled lockdown. In fact, a lot of people have said of the Conservative government that it was a very Labour kind of policy that they instituted. And all Labour have done, they haven't challenged the government on any of it. All that they've done is said, well, we would have implemented more measures sooner and harder. That's pretty much all that they said. And I've been finding more and more common ground with people on the left who are questioning uh, what is happening, you know, that, that it seems like those who are on the left and the right are coming to say very similar things. So let me just quote you from the Left Lockdown Skeptics website, which this was an article published um, a few weeks ago. Expecting governments to solve everything, including virus spread, has been partly responsible for getting us into the mess of the last two years. It is never acceptable for government to take away personal rights, 
civil liberties and democratic freedoms and hand them over to an unaccountable technocratic elite of public health officials or regime friendly experts. There we go. I agree with every word of that. And I think that the, maybe the time has come for those who are on the right and those who are on the left maybe to, to come together to build some common ground and to actually say, you know, maybe we can we can come together to find something which will work. So let's think then about what we all want. Let's think about the things that everyone wants, left or right. Uh, I've put three things down and there are, I'm sure, more things that could be said, but I think these three would be good to go on. The first thing is to secure our freedom, something which the government has completely forgotten uh, in the last few years, which is that they are there to secure our freedoms, not to control us, but to secure our freedom. That's fundamental. That's one of the first things. The second thing is to protect the most vulnerable so we want the vulnerable to be protected. We want them to be protected from malicious individuals or corporations who would abuse them. So we all want the, the poor, the vulnerable to be protected. Well, we want everyone to be protected, but especially the most vulnerable. And the third and final thing is to maintain law and order. You know, it's impossible to have a society without uh, a sort of functioning society, really, without uh, the rule of law without law and order, without just a just and fair kind of punishment system and so on. So we want the government to maintain law and order as well. I'm sure there are other things that you could add to that, but let's go with that for the moment, okay? To secure our freedom, to protect the most vulnerable, to maintain law and order. So what's the root problem in doing that? Now, this is where those of you who are listening on the podcast will need to exercise your imagination slightly because I've got a diagram here. I'm quite proud of this diagram, um, but um, those of you who are just listening won't be able to see it. So I'll have to explain. So I've got um, there um, the government and the people. And whether you go with a capitalist system or a socialist system, the problem is the same which is, as, as we were talking about in the previous session, it's the issue of sin. It's the issue of the corruption of human nature, which is, you know, as Christianity says, is original sin. It is there in everybody. You know, all of us have that kind of corruption. We can all be greedy and selfish and do wrong things. And we all have that potential to do, to do wrong. The problem is with capitalism... The particular problem with capitalism is that that sin is seen in, in the people. So in corporations, in individuals, you know, if you give people freedom, then some of those people will use that freedom to do wrong. So that's the issue with capitalism. It kind of sets people free, but the freedom they have is to do wrong. Um, but the problem, on the other hand, on the other side uh, with socialism is that that sin then gets more seen more in the government. Um, and I've put you know, corruption and greed on both sides. So um, corruption and greed in the government, of course, you, know, you, you end up with the government having big palaces and mansions and you know, basically taking all of the, the good things and giving the people very little because the government have got all the power. And that's what tends to happen in these kind of um, authoritarian uh, socialist kind of systems the government takes on more and more power and ends up uh, as they say absolute power corrupts absolutely so there's the problem that sin applies to everyone whether that be in the people or in the government or in the experts or wherever everywhere in society and this is what i've said that there is no political system which can solve the problem of sin. That is the root problem to everything, and that's what everyone has to deal with. And I do feel sometimes like, uh, again, you know, if you go back to people like Grace Blakely or, or others, you know, who who think that every problem in society can be solved just with a bit more regulation. But unfortunately, that doesn't account for the fact that the people making the rules 
are also people who are selfish and greedy in other ways. You know, it's not that you've got a, a perfect, you've got um, government who are perfect, who are just only operating for the good of others. Um, so there's the issue there, I think, that, you know, there's no political system which can actually deal with that problem. And I hope that's what we saw in the previous session. So let's think now about what a Christian government might actually look like. Remember when we were doing the Building a Christian Worldview series that we looked at those four steps, the creation, the fall, the redemption and the consummation. And you can go back and look at the introduction to the series if you want to know what those four things actually are. But let's apply them now to thinking about what the government might look like, just briefly, what the government might look like if they were within those bounds. Uh, so under creation, I said that, you know, we, we believe that God exists. And I think that is fundamental. You know, you have to have a society which believes that God exists. Because if God does not exist, then anything is permissible, as Dostoevsky said. So we have to start with God existing. It has to be a monotheistic uh, culture. We need to believe, that, therefore, that the world has been made in certain ways and not others. So, for example, marriage and gender. You know, we believe that God has created us in certain ways, not in other ways. So the government should be based on those ways and, and with that aim to kind of um, aim to have the kind of world which God made. Um, we live in the real world. I think this is quite an important one. As we were thinking about um, last week, we were looking at the virtual reality and secularism. And I think that's a big problem, as, as we, we thought about at the start. You know, we need to live in the real world as it actually is. The world, you know, where, where we can be truthful about the world, rather than living in this fantasy virtual reality where things are true just because the politician says so or the media say so. Uh, we need to say that the world is good and we need to be responsible stewards. So so creation kind of gives us uh, a an aim. It gives us a, you know, says this is what the world should be like. It gives us a picture of what the world should be like. And that's what we should be aiming for. But when it comes to the fall, we need to remember that we as human beings are flawed and sinful. And so that means for the government that no one should be given absolute power. You, you can't trust people with too much power. But at the end of the day, we need to have accountability. We need to have democracy. We need to have the ability to put the brakes on. Because if someone is running away with power, then they need to be stopped. So there needs to be accountability. There needs to be democracy. And we should expect bad behaviour from people, from individuals, from businesses, um, and then seek to mitigate it. So, you know, to, to expect the world not to be perfect and to try to do what we can to mitigate that, that is, um, that's, that's um, important. So that's the creation and the fall. Uh, the redemption and consummation. So in terms of the, the redemption... There should be a focus on Christianity as the ultimate solution, because we know at the end of the day that our behaviour is not going to be changed to, for the better, really, with rules. That that might limit the worst excesses of our behaviour, but really we need a greater transformation of the heart, which only God can bring through Jesus Christ. That means that we should have freedom of Christian worship. And in fact, there should be a Christian basis in, in Parliament, even, even amongst those who make our laws. There should be a Christian uh, basis in, in our lawmaking. And our leaders should be servants, you know, as Jesus was, that he came not, not to be served, but to serve. And so our leaders should also seek to serve as well. They should have that Christian ethos in leadership. So that's what redemption would look like in, in government. And finally, the consummation. To remember that the perfect society will never be created till Jesus returns. 
that we can never get this utopian vision of society, especially not through more regulation. You know, you can't regulate human nature out of its sinfulness. That's not just not possible. Uh, that actually the government has very limited power to make changes and that we can't create utopia through just you know making a few more rules, putting in a few more quangos or whatever it may be. That we need something deeper and we're only going to get there when Jesus returns. So it hopefully gives us, you know, prevents us from being over optimistic about what is possible when it comes to to change in society and especially what the government can do. Now what is interesting to me is that many of these things are technically in place in the UK already. Let's just think through a few of those things. What I said about creation, many of our laws are based on Christian principles. That's already there. And as Tom Holland said in Dominion, and I've mentioned that book a few times, but nothing has had a greater greater influence on the Western world than the Bible. So we are already hugely influenced by Christianity. When it comes to the fall, um, we already have demo- democratic accountability. Now, you may argue that the democratic accountability is not great enough. And I certainly have come to believe that over the last couple of years. I think there are definitely changes which can and should be made when it comes to democratic accountability. Nonetheless, we do have it in a way that many civilizations, almost every civilization through history has not had. So, you know, we do have that at least. Uh, regulation does exist to try to protect individuals from unscrupulous um, other individuals and and from corporations. Um, So there is regulation which seeks to mitigate some of the the worst effects of of human nature. And there's a separation of powers, the the parliament, the executive, the judiciary. I was listening to an interview with uh, Jonathan Sumption about this on um, John Anderson's channel, uh, week or two ago he was talking about this in the UK there's this separation of power so that no one um, body should be able to have ultimate authority so they should be able to keep each other in check and sadly again over the last couple of years that hasn't worked very well in fact you might say it's failed and perhaps there are reasons for that which we might come on to and then when it comes to redemption uh, we have bishops in the house of lords There are prayers at the start of Parliament. So, you know, we are, Parliament should in theory be be Christian. And the church is established by law. The monarch is the supreme governor of the Church of England. And on that note, what I would like to do is just read you a little bit from the Queen's coronation service back in um, 1953. The Queen was asked these questions by the then Archbishop of Canterbury. Will you, to the utmost of your power, maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel? Will you, to the utmost of your power, maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant reformed religion established by law? Will you maintain and preserve inviolably the settlement of the Church of England and the doctrine, worship, discipline and government thereof as by law established in England? And will you preserve unto the bishops and clergy of England and to the churches there committed to their charge, all such rights and privileges as by law do or shall appertain to them or any of them. So the Queen took an oath when she was uh, at the coronation to uphold the Christian religion and uphold the Church of England. And that's something which, um, yeah, which was done, you know, 70 years ago, of course. So... The Queen should have been upholding Christianity in the country and making sure that Christianity uh, was there. So where did it all go wrong? That's a really good question to ponder. And, you know, given that we've got a Christian basis for our, our country, how did we end up in a situation where it seems like we've got so unchristian? Um, 
It's interesting, in the 20th century, there was kind of a balance between the Conservative and Labour parties. Uh, I remember my English teacher, when I was in a secondary school, my English teacher telling us about the way that it used to work, how the you know, you, you get the Conservatives come in who would who wouldn't spend much, who would, you know, be kind of fiscally responsible, and then Labour would be elected for a little while. They would spend and they would, you know, get rid of all the money, you know, spend all the money, and then the Conservatives would come back and try and row it back. And and he said actually there was quite a good balance. And that's how it worked. And I think that that was quite interesting. I do feel like, you know, traditionally Labour have been the voice of the working class, have stood up for the, those who are vulnerable, and I think that's a good thing to do. And, you know, often Conservatives have been accused of not caring um, when uh, businesses and so on behave in a wrong way. So I think, you know, through the 20th century, at least for some of the time, there was a bit of a balance going on of, of concerns. And that seems to have gone. Um... And actually, I think the root problem is this secularism. As we were looking at uh, last week, secularism has undermined any confidence in the Christian narrative. This idea that you can solve every problem without God, and all you need to do is just have human, you know, humanism, humanist rules, just encourage people to be good, just regulate it, all of those things without God. You know, turning away from God and having this secular society. I think that's the root of where the problems have come in. It doesn't matter how officially Christian you are if you don't believe it. And that, I think, is, is where we are as a nation. That although we have Christianity is officially all over the place when it comes to the government, when it comes to parliament, it seems like, you know, so many don't really believe it and don't even don't see that it's even important. Now, I think there are people who are not maybe Christian themselves, but who nonetheless see the importance of Christianity in our country and in our country's laws. But I think so many people don't even see that anymore. They're just entirely secular and godless, that we can just do it all ourselves without God. And the church has grown increasingly secular and liberal and now looks virtually identical to the secular world. So the church even, the Church of England, is not uh, giving a witness to the truth, but is just more and more looks like exactly what the world looks like. And there was a really good article about this called The Closing of the Episcopal Mind by Kappel Loft. And that was in the, the Critic magazine. I'll put the link to that down below if you'd like to read it. So I think that's where it all went wrong, that although it should, these things should have kept us from going down a wrong path, that, you know, having that the Christianity there, rather than being sort of about left and right, per se, actually having people who, um, who were Christian should have, and having that, that kind of officially being there, should have stopped us from going down that road. But unfortunately, it hasn't. And I would just like to to say that, you know, I love the Queen and I've certainly been a big, very much impressed with with her more and more. As she's she's been very open about her faith. She talks about Jesus probably more than the Archbishop of Canterbury and, and so on, you know, in, in her public um, broadcasts. At the same time, uh, looking at that... Looking at her coronation oath, I do wonder if she could have done more to actually uphold that oath. And I appreciate that she has been put in a very difficult situation. But at the end of the day, you do need to have a king or a queen who will be have steel and who will be able to put their foot down when the, the country wants to run in the wrong direction. And the queen has signed laws into into law you know the queen still has to sign off on laws officially and the queen has signed off on laws which have been unchristian and i know it would have been difficult for her to not do that but nonetheless i think as a christian perhaps she could have done more about that and and put a foot down and say no i will not do this as a christian you'll have to change the constitution 
And so, um, yeah, I, I think I think that you know that a, a stronger a stronger lead from the queen or a stronger lead from whoever was is is the king or the queen um could have done more actually to prevent us going down that way and could have done more to keep the church in the right ways so you know, leadership does matter and you know looking at it i think the particularly in this country having that that style monarchy which is you know designed to protect the faith that title of the the queen or the king you know fides defensor defender of the faith and that's if you look on a coin it says fd fides defensor that's that's the title defender of the faith which was originally given i believe to henry the eighth by the pope but that's what the the king or the queen's supposed to do defend the faith and i think that is one area where i think the queen has i mean she's kept her own faith i'm not sure that she's kept the faith of the country uh, she probably could have done more so that's one criticism that i would have um of of the queen but i don't want to lay all the blame at her feet of course i'd just like to finish this section by saying you know what we've ended up with is a a situation where all of these rituals exist these christian rituals exist in parliament or in um you know around we've got the church of england we've got an established church we've got a monarch who is um you know sworn to uphold christian religion and so on and it, it doesn't seem to have done very much it's just become empty it's hollowed out it's just become a ritual which is virtually meaningless you know having prayer prayers in parliament having the bishops in parliament and so on is is virtually meaningless and it reminded me of the way that God criticised the people of Israel in the Old Testament. For example, Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13. These people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And this is what happened in ancient Israel, that the people just were going through the motions, but were not actually worshipping God. And I think that's what's happening in so much of the higher tiers of society in, in government and in and so on. Although there are Christian things there which should be should have protected us, actually they are they're just rituals. They're going through the motions, but there's nothing behind them that the people don't believe, really. And um, this is the problem. So. I just wanted to finish by saying that at the end of the day, no political system will protect us if the people at the top don't actually believe in God, don't actually believe in Christianity. That secularism has, I think, really the root cause of what has happened. That as we've turned away from God, it's allowed us to turn to other things, even when there were mechanisms in place which should have protected us. Um, so yeah and and there are a lot of reasons for that there's a lot more you could say which we will say at some point um, but I've finished finished there for now um, dead ritualism is um, as, as open the door to secularism and uh, lo and behold here we are and so let's finish the podcast then with a reflection from Romans as we've been working through Romans. We've got to Romans chapter 3 this week, Romans chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. So let me read that out and, um, and then we'll have a, just a, a little thought about it. What advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, 
If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still con- condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Their condemnation is just. Okay, so recall that as we saw in the previous passage that uh, Paul was talking about the Jews having the law and saying it doesn't matter if you have the law if you don't obey it. And we were thinking about, you know, virtue signalling and how people are very keen to, um, you know, signal their keeping of the law, even if it didn't actually mean that they were themselves good people. So Paul is now turning to say, well, what what advantage is there then in being a Jew? What value is there in circumcision, he says? As much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. So he said, the point is not that you yourselves are good, but that you've been entrusted with the words of God. And it's valuable because he is good. It doesn't matter, he says, if some were unfaithful, because, as he says, let God be true and every human being a liar. Um, So God is true. His words are true, even if the people who have those words don't listen to them. It doesn't make God out to be a liar. Of course, he's always true, even if every human being is a liar. Uh, And so Paul says, If our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, is God unjust? And uh, he's saying, of course not, because God has to judge the world. You know, if if God giving us his law brings out the fact that we don't keep the law, does that make God unjust? And Paul says, no, that's a ridiculous argument to make. You know, God has to judge the world. Of course he does. Um, And he just deals with one more argument saying, If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, why am I still condemned? And um, he says, some people might say, let us do evil that good may result. You know, because if I do evil, then it will show God to be in in the right. And he says, their condemnation is just. Again, what a ridiculous argument. You know, this idea that if we have God's law, but do not do it, that in some way that is actually a good thing. You know, it's it's just dealing with this argument that we have the law and so therefore the responsibility is on us to do it. The thing which really struck me as I was reading through this passage um, is actually Paul's brief words there, let, let God be true and every human being a liar. And that really made me think, you know, given what we were started out the podcast thinking about, about living in this fantasy world that God is truth and we can't trust human beings always to tell the truth. Now, the truth is actually a precious commodity and God is the source of all truth. So therefore, if you take God out of the picture, you take truth out of the picture as well, ultimately. And this is something which I think we've seen, haven't we, with the secular culture, that you take God out of the picture And truth begins to fall away as well. So I really think that this says a lot to us today. That, you know, if we want truth, and we we should, it's something that everyone should want, then we need God. As Jesus said, actually, he was saying this in the um, the trial, in John's Gospel in the trial, and he was before Pilate. He said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And I think, you know, if you're on the side of truth, you need to listen to God because actually God is ultimate truth. He is a source and ground of truth. And when that falls away, then you know our untruth does not stop God being true. So, you know, we need to get back to God. We need to get back to him and listen to to what he has to say. And and it's only that way that we are going to find find our way back if Western society is not doomed. The other day I was uh, listening to a, just a clip with uh, Peter Hitchens uh, interviewing John Anderson uh, or, or being interviewed, sorry, by John Anderson. And Peter Hitchens said he thought you know, Western civilization was finished. There was no hope. I think there is hope 
but only if we come back to God. And if we come back to the God who is true, even though we are, do not tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth all the time. Actually, God is true. And we need we need a, a society which is based on truth rather than on lies. And so therefore, we need a society which is based on God because it is his world. He is the truth. Goes back to what I was saying a few um, a few months ago now. I think Francis Schaeffer put this in the Christian Manifesto. But saying that, you know, God is not just, Christianity is not just true, it is the truth, which is a very, is a difference between those things. It is the truth, it's the ground of everything. So that's the the reflection for today. Uh, let's take a moment to, to pray about this and ask for God's help. Um, I don't want Western society to be doomed. I really want there to be change. But in order to do that, we're going to have to come back to the God who is true. And we're going to have to base our lives on reality uh, once again. So let's pray and ask God about that. Heavenly Father, we recognise that we are in a, a difficult situation at the moment as a Western world. We are facing um, a precipice. And we know, Lord, that um, if we carry on, uh, going down this the, the route of, of fantasy reality that we will um, run off a cliff we'll destroy ourselves but we know lord that there is always a way back uh, for those who trust in you if we turn back to you you will uh, bring us back uh, to your truth and to living in in this the world that you've created in your ways and we pray heavenly father and called out to you that you would change the hearts of many in our society from the uh, those in power those in government through to just ordinary people uh, we ask heavenly father that you would bring many people back to your truth and we ask lord that there will be a real work of your holy spirit to uh, bring us back to walking in your ways in your world uh, with you as the source of our truth let God be true and every man a liar. And we pray, Lord, that um, you would especially revive your church. And we pray, Lord, not just for the Church of England, but for all uh, churches, all Christians up and down our country to be uh, on fire for you and wanting to spread your light and your truth wherever uh, we may be. So please empower us and strengthen us, we pray. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining me today. I hope that you've appreciated this. Don't forget, if you'd like to join in, there's Telegram, there is um, the YouTube comments, and there is uh, the email, sacredmusingspod at gmail.com, if you'd like to get in touch by email. And if you'd like to support me, then um, I'm kind of freelance. I'm just, you know, supported by, by this kind of thing. And um, there's a buy me a coffee link down below if you'd like to um, to support me in a financial way. So thanks so much, everyone. I really do appreciate your joining in and I hope that you're finding these helpful. Thanks so much for all your positive comments about it. I really do appreciate all of this. It means such a lot to know that people are listening to these, watching these, enjoying them and benefiting from them. And I hope that, um, yeah, um, it, that will continue and you'll continue to enjoy and benefit from it. And it's great to get to know some of you a little bit as well in comments and things. So see you again soon, everyone. I'll see you next week. But until then, God bless.